Good morning, everybody. Welcome to church this morning. To those of you online, welcome to you as well. Several online. We've got kind of a mini COVID outbreak with some of the families. Our service this morning is revolving around Daniel chapter 7. Uh, I don't know how much you know of it. But hopefully you'll know more at the end than uh, you maybe do now. It really is about God being in control, God being over all things, which for us is a message to give us confidence, that gives us hope and trust in him for the future. I'm going to read just one verse, and then I'm going to ask the music team to lead us in some songs, which you all know they have the idea of hope and confidence in the Lord. Uh, from Daniel chapter 7, a key verse, it says that he, that is, uh, we'll explain who the he is later on, but it's around about God, it's around about Jesus, was given authority and glory and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will never pass away. And his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. This is the God, this is the Saviour, the Lord that we worship this morning. Let me see your glory around us. When we think of all that you've made, we think of all your faithfulness, when we think of the cross, when we think of the resurrection, and when we think of your return, Lord Jesus, we've come this morning with those things in our heart to worship and to praise you. Thank you for who you are. Thank you for your kindness and mercy. Forgive us. We know we're not worthy of your love. And we're not here because we're good. We're here because of your grace and kindness to us. Forgive us and cleanse us as we come into your presence with that precious blood of Jesus. Come and say we love you. We're thankful that you're our God, that our God is the great God, the God of power and the God of hope. And may we live, may our hearts thrill at the thought of the living hope that is in us through Jesus this morning. Speak to us, bless us. For those who are feeling downcast in heart and soul this morning, would you speak to them by your spirit and lift them up? Those who are walking on the mountain tops and enjoying the glow of your love, would you bless them still further? May we leave this place, all of us, saying it was good for us to be here this morning. For your glory, in Jesus' name. Amen.
take your seats. Great to sing of the hope, great to sing of the victory of Jesus, isn't it? As we start this morning, let's come and pray together. Lord Jesus, we thank you for those songs which we sang just now uh, about your greatness. We thank you that you are a God who is in control. And would you teach us that and remind us that and encourage us of that as we come to look in your word in a few moments? But we thank you that as we hear you speak, we can bring you our prayers as well. And it's one of the ways in which we can keep in touch with you. And so we come and we praise you and we pray to you this morning. We thank you for uh, Wednesday evening and the clay shoot, uh, for the safety that we had, for the weather that we had, but most of all, undoubtedly, for the people that were there and to be able to share with them something of the good news of Jesus. And we would water that word and ask that the men that were there would remember it, that they would be thinking about it, that it would be prompting their, their thought and, and thoughts about you and themselves and eternity. Lord, we pray that that, that seed that Paul sown would not return uh, empty, but that in accordance with the promise of your word, there will be fruit and results from it. We pray for each man that was there. For those that said, yeah, I'd like to come along to other things, Lord, put it in their minds to do that, that they would come and join us on Sundays or come along to some of the men's events or at least come along to other special things that we have. So we thank you for that. Uh, we thank you for uh, the work that goes on here in so many different ways during the week that we, most of us, don't really see much of, but the work with uh, the young mums and, and the toddlers and the carers on Friday morning. I want to thank you for the work of EPIC, and what a joy it was to go and see all those children and be part of that on Friday night. And uh, Father, thank you. There are nearly 30 children there. And uh, having so much fun and hearing a little bit more about you. And we pray for those children this morning and ask in their young lives that you will, you will sow a seed and you'll be bringing them to faith and trust in you. Thank you for the leaders of, of EPIC and the leaders of, of all the different groups that we have. Lord, thank you for those who put time and effort into the planning and the organization, uh, as, as well as actually being here this morning, uh, during the week and, and this morning. We thank you for them all and ask that you'll bless them. And then, Lord, we would finally pray for ourselves as we live out our lives on the front line, as we've been thinking in the book of Daniel. Would you help us to live lives of integrity, lives of trust and confidence in you, and for that we ask, that as now we dig into your word, that you'll speak to us and help us and encourage us and strengthen us. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. I'm going to ask Mary uh, to come and bring us our reading. And then we're going to sing a song together. And then we're going to dig into this passage a bit this morning. So it's Daniel chapter 7, if you've got your Bibles. Reading taken from Daniel chapter 7. Verse 1 to 14. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions passed through his mind as he was lying on his bed. He wrote down the substance of his dream. Daniel said, in my vision at night I looked and there before me were the four winds of heaven churning up the great sea. Four great beasts, each different from the others, came up out of the sea. The first was like a lion, and it had the wings of an eagle. I watched until its wings were torn off, and it was lifted from the ground so that it stood on two feet like a man, and the heart of a man was given to it. And there before me was a second beast, which looked like a bear. It was raised up on one of its sides and it had three ribs in its mouth between its teeth. It was told, get up and eat your fill of flesh. After that, I looked and there before me was another beast, one that looked like a leopard and on its back it had four wings like those of a bird. This beast had four heads 
and it was given authority to rule. After that, in my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was a fourth beast, terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had large iron teeth. It crushed and devoured its victims and trampled underneath whatever was left. It was different from all the former beasts, and it had ten horns. While I was thinking about the horns, there before me was another horn, a little one, which came up among them, and three of the first horns were uprooted before it. This horn had eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth that spoke boastfully. As I looked, Thrones were set in place, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. His clothing was as white as snow, the hair of his head was white like wool. His throne was flaming with fire, and its wheels were all ablaze. A river of fire was flowing, coming out from before him. Thousands upon thousands attended him. 10,000 times 10,000 stood before him. The court was seated and the books were opened. Then I continued to watch because of the boastful words the horn was speaking. I kept looking until the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. The other beasts had been stripped of their authority, but were allowed to live for a period of time. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like the sun, like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All peoples, nations, and men of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Amen. Let's get into the word this morning for a few minutes and hear what the word says and why we've chosen these songs this morning. We're still in Daniel, as I've told you, and we are in chapter 7, which brings us into a completely different section of the book. In one sense, we could have stopped the series Living on the Front Line where we've been, um, where, we, where we were, uh, because this second section, the, the second, not of chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12, are completely different, but they have the same theme, the same theme of God being in control. What we've tried to show you over the, the first few chapters, uh, the, the, the theme that's there is very clearly of Daniel as we see his life and the scrapes and the situations that he and his friends get into or are put into, that every time God comes through for them. We've seen that God was in control of their individual lives. As we Move into chapter 7 and the succeeding verses, chapters. What we see now, the, 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 it's like the, there's a revelation here. The curtain is, is pulled away a little bit to see God's control, not only of, of individuals' lives, but God's control of the nations. That God is in control over all the things on earth and particularly in control of those who oppose him. This is a really relevant word for us. We see a world in chaos, don't we? We see a world where there are those who seem to do what they want and no one seems to be able to stop them. Myanmar came and went from our news. At the moment, it's Ukraine. Another time, it will be the Taliban in Afghanistan. And no one seems to be able to stand against these Malign forces that throw over every semblance of decency and order and fairness and justice that we would hold precious. What we see in Daniel is that God is in control of these 
things. And it's here for our encouragement. We, in this chapter, discover hideous creatures. Uh, as we move on, we will see mysterious numbers um, and plenty more of hard-to-understand things for us. But all which take us to see God being in control for us. I personally love this stuff. It's called apocalyptic uh, language. It's a, it's a genre of, of writing. I'm not going to pretend to you that I understand it all. Uh, I've done a lot of reading and a lot of listening trying to prepare for this. I preached through Daniel before, but never tackled chapters 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. I've always chickened out at this point. Well, we're, So I'm launching into areas that I've not been before. I'm not going to tell you that I understand it all. I think that would be arrogant. Uh, if, anybody, if anybody tells you they do, then question them. When we get to chapters like this, where there are things which are hard to understand, we have to tread carefully. We have to hold it uh, humbly. We might form our opinions, have a sense of this is what I think God is revealing to us. But on the details, we have to be really humble because there are people, as I said to uh, to Peter and Diane yesterday, you know, there are people with more letters after their name than I've got in my name who have spent their life studying these things and they come to different conclusions on some of the finer details. We don't need to trouble our minds about the details, but we do need to understand and what we will understand is the big picture here that God is in control. So if you're asking me to interpret for you the 100, 1,250 days, uh, the time times and half a time, and uh, those kind of things, I'm afraid you're going to be looking at the wrong person uh, on that. Go and do your own reading, but we're going to see that God is in control of those things. What I love about this, these chapters, is that there are some of the most staggering predictions, the most staggering uh, comments on what is going to happen in the future. And with the benefit of hindsight, we can see how they came true. Time, centuries sometimes, after Daniel was given this revelation, this unveiling of what was going to happen. When you come to passages like this and you read about beasts and all of that, you really need to think of uh, the likes of Chronicles of Narnia. You need to think about Lord of the Rings. It's that genre of writing. You know in Lord of the Rings, there's fantastical creatures, make-believe animals, uh, places, and, and they've all got a hidden meaning. There's a, there's a narrative behind it. Uh, Narnia, it's the same kind of thing. We know that and love those stories of Narnia. If you haven't read all of the stories of Narnia, then do. Uh, I grew up with The Lion, the Witch, and the Wardrobe, but confess until about six years ago, I hadn't read the others in the, in the series that C.S. Lewis had written. And as a 50-something, as a I got really engrossed in reading my children's books. They're just brilliant. But that's the genre of writing we've got here. Behind the mysteries are meanings and purposes. And I want to show you some of those as we go through this morning. So here we go. We're doing faith on the front line. The big theme here is that God is in control of the nations. Daniel was living in a time when his people, his friends, the Jewish people, uh, were, were dispirited. They were living pulled away and unable at this point to go to their own country. They weren't slaves, but neither were they free. They longed to go back home. They'd been captives for something like 40 or 50 years, forced away from home in exile. They longed to go back, but nothing seemed to be happening. Unjust rulers seemed to demand of them whatever they wanted, and they were, they were really close to giving up. Uh, there's a passage in, I think it's in, in one of the Psalms, it, it talks about playing our harps or hanging our harps on the willows. How can we sing a, a glad song in the situation we're in? It was that kind of idea, and that's how they felt. And God is speaking to give them a message of hope. You may be here this morning, or you may pass through times in your life where you just don't know what's happening. And you think, where is God in this you may look at the international scene, and I'm sure we do, and we think, where is God in this? 
these passages speak into that. So let's have a look. First of all, we're going to go through this obviously fairly quickly this morning, but I hope not too quickly, not so quickly that you don't get the sense of what it's about. First of all, this dream, it's a nightmarish dream that reveals a sad reality. We're talking 550-ish BC at this point. That's an important little detail to keep in mind. 550 BC. And Daniel finds himself or sees himself standing beside a storm-tossed sea that is stirred up by the four winds of heaven. And out of the sea, this chaotic picture of sea comes these ghastly beasts as Daniel describes them. The first one is a lion with, but it's not just an ordinary lion, it's a lion with eagle's wings. The wings are eventually ripped off and the lion transforms, mutates into a human with the mind of a human. The key to understanding this bit Lions and eagles, what are they known for? We have a pride of lions. Eagles are known as the, 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 the prince of the birds. There is a sense of pride, and certainly in Daniel's time, that's what the picture conjured up. It was a picture of pride and arrogance. That was the first beast. And then after that, verse 5, comes a second beast. It's a bear, and uh, it's... Bears are known for their aggression, and this one was certainly an aggressive bear. It got ribs in its mouth, uh, three ribs, and it's given permission and told to go on the rampage and eat and devour whatever it wanted to have its fill. It's a picture of aggression, unstoppable devouring. And then the third beast is the leopard. But again, not just a leopard, it's a leopard with wings. You think of leopards. What do you think of as a, a leopard? Leopards are known for their speed, aren't they? And the wings, the fact it's got wings and uh, its feet don't touch the ground, it's a, it's a vision of speed. Just remember these things. We'll come back to them next week as well. Verse 7 has the last beast, the fourth beast. It's not really described as anything in particular. But it is told, we're told it was terrifying and frightening and very powerful. It had iron teeth that crushed and devoured and trampled everything. If you've seen these demolition programs, or you've seen the big demolition things with the hydraulics and huge iron teeth, that was the kind of the picture that came to my mind. And it just crushes everything as it rips buildings to pieces. That was the image that we've got here. It's got 10 horns that grew, and then another one which displaced three of them. And that dominant horn was full of eyes, and, and I had a mouth that spoke boastfully. Each of these beasts was some kind of hybrid, and it was designed to evoke horror in the minds of the Jews of the time. You see, deep in the Jewish psyche was a hatred of anything that was hybridized. God had set in order, when he made things, he made every animal in its own kind. And if we, time and we were doing a Bible study on this, I would take you through and show how in the Old Testament laws, God had set down that the Jews were not to mix things. When they made garments, they, there were certain materials that they were not to mix together they were to keep things separate because God had made them as they were meant to be when we see here then leopards with wings it's not how it's meant to be when we see lions with eagles wings there's a mixture here and it would instantly tell these Jews that this was a, a, a force that was against God here are forces, here are things that are anti-God. These are bad things. It is meant to evoke in their minds and ours horror and terror at what is going on. These beasts come out of the sea. It was a sea that was 
uh, tumultuous. It was churning up the great sea from four winds in the Jewish understanding of the time. The sea was a picture of chaos. So we've got chaos and we've got these beasts coming out of the chaos. It was, it was a horrible scene for them. But what, does it, what does it mean for us? Well, we didn't read the second half of the chapter. But it's in the second half of the chapter where the explanation is given. That the beasts represented four kingdoms. And we need to look at other passages. We need to look at chapter 2. We need to compare it with chapter 2. Chapter 8 and also in the book of Revelation, which again we haven't time to do this morning, but you can. We're going to give you the references on there to have a look at. But we do know we're told, Daniel was told, that these four, grace, four beasts in verse 17, the four great beasts are four kings that will rise from the earth. By comparing these creatures with the, the vision of Nebuchadnezzar's statue in chapter 2 and the visions in chapter 8, we can be pretty confident as to what they mean. So I'll put it on here. The eagle-winged lion represents Babylon. Arrogant, proud, and remember Nebuchadnezzar who was sent out, or was it Belteshazzar? One of the two, I can't, it's gone from my mind. And, and was turned into, a, into an animal for a period of time before he came back to his senses. The, the point was there was arrogance, there was pride. The, the second, the aggressive bear, we'll explain this again, we'll probably come back to this next week in chapter 8, was the Medo-Persian Empire. Chapter 8, verse 20, specifically says, in a different dream, but of a, as a two-horned ram in that situation, but it's the Medo-Persian Empire that was going to follow the Babylonian Empire. The winged leopard that speaks of speed, Romans uh, chapter 8, Daniel chapter 8, verse 21, tells us that that was the Greek empire. And the Greek empire was known for the speed with which it overthrew the current world empires of the time. It's just history tells us, records the speed with which the Greek empire overran everything in its way. The fourth terrifying beast not quite so sure about this one. Commentators uh, differ. Um, my personal thought is it's probably Rome uh, that it's referring to. But not just Rome, but probably Rome and all of the other evil empires and the evil forces and powers that lead through until the coming of Jesus. We'll probably say more about that as we go through next week. So here we've got, though, this vision of empires, of these powers of what was then and he says what's going to come there'll be another one after this and we know the Medes took over uh, we got to that last week at the end of chapter six Dar that was Darius he was the Mede so the Babylonians were overthrown by the Medes we know that the Medes were overthrown by the Persians and we uh, we know that the Persians were overthrown by the Greeks and the Greeks were overthrown by the Romans what God said here did come true but then all of a sudden did you notice as, uh, as Mary was reading, you get to verse 8 and 9 and, and the scene changes. Away from the chaos, away from the churning, destructive beasts, we find a, a reassuring reality for frightened people. The scene moves from beasts and seas to a palace and thrones, and clouds. Chaos is replaced by calm. The thrones were set up, and the Ancient of Days took his seat. Unthreatened is a picture of order and authority. The description in verse 9 of the Ancient of Days white as snow, hair of his head, like white, like wool, his throne blazing with fire. It's not about age. We should never imagine God as the, as the old man upstairs, as he's sometimes colloquially described. This here is conveying to us reverence. It's conveying authority. It's conveying control. You see, 
The elders is what it's talking about here. Not an old, senile old man, but somebody who's in control, somebody with wisdom, somebody with understanding. And he took his seat on the throne. And a river of fire was flowing. Not chaotic, churning up, but a river flowing. What we have here is a picture of God the Father. And then in verse 13, we're introduced to one who's described as one like the Son of Man. In my vision at night, I looked and there before me was one like a Son of Man who comes riding on the clouds. So we've got a cloud rider here. Who's the cloud rider? Well, cloud riding in the Old Testament, in Jewish understanding, was one of the images they had of God, being in control over things. The cloud rider, we know then, has to be God. But the Ancient of Days, the one who's on the throne is God. So what do we got with the cloud rider? The cloud rider, you can see on the screen, is Jesus. And it's interesting, when you read the New Testament, you read Matthew's Gospel particularly, and when Jesus speaks of himself, he talks about himself as the Son of Man. That was his favorite way of talking about himself. He didn't say I and me and that kind of thing. He would say the Son of Man. Jesus was taking that title here from Daniel. Daniel is describing this Son of Man, and he's talking about Jesus. When people say, here's a little aside for you, when people say that Jesus doesn't claim to be God in the Bible, he talks about being the son of God. Jesus uses the phrase, the son of man. That was a title that was attributed to one who was in control. That was a title in the Old Testament that was about God. So every time Jesus said the Son of Man, those who knew their scriptures would know what he was talking about. He was claiming divinity. He was claiming to be God. So when you have people knock on your door, when you get into conversation with people, this is a good one to take them to, the Son of Man and Daniel. Daniel gets this vision into the, 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 cloud, the, the throne room and he sees this Ancient of days and the, and the Son of Man coming to take his throne and, and be given authority. Meanwhile, out of the window, I kind of imagined it like this. Out of the window, he sees, uh, verse 11, the, the boastful words of the horn speaking. And the beast was slain and its body destroyed and thrown into the blazing fire. So he sees, as it were, the Ancient of Days. He sees the cloud riding Son of Man. But out of the window, also, he can see the beast being destroyed. The other three beasts being allowed to, allowed to live is what he says. They were allowed, the other beasts were stripped of their authority, but allowed to live for a little while longer. You get that? They were allowed to live for a little while. What does it tell us? It tells us they weren't in control after all. As great and as mighty and powerful as the forces of evil think they're in control, they're actually only allowed to, they can only do as much as they're allowed to do. It tells us that the ancient of days and the cloud riding saviour are the ones who are in control. They were allowed, but only for a little time. And the recurring theme of these second half of Daniel's letter or Daniel's prophecy is, is the control of God. It's, it's for, a, for a certain period, for a limited period, every time. And the numbers and the details, the fact that there's a, a, a limited number, 1,250, 1,280, a time, times and half a time, whatever they mean, they mean a time, an allotted time, a specific time. In other words, God is in control. And at the end of that time, his purposes will continue to be worked out. Their time was limited by the ancient of days. And the cloud rider, though, the son of man, 
would be given a kingdom, we're told in verse 14, of authority and glory and power, and all nations and peoples of every language would worship him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion. It's not limited by any time. It's an everlasting dominion that will not pass away. His kingdom is one that will never be destroyed. Babylon, Medes, Persians, Greek, Romans, where are they? They've gone. And you can look at other more ones since then. They all come. They have their time and they go. What we're seeing here is the kingdom of King Jesus will never end. And I think this is a wonderful revelation of reassurance to the Jews then who wondered, where was God? What's he doing? It's like God's working his purposes out. We look at our lives and we look at, the, we look at culture, we look at the world today, it says the same to us. The nations will rise, empires will rise, rulers will rise, but it will be for a period of time. And the kingdom of Jesus will outlast them all. The reality is that we live in a world of chaos. It's an uncomfortable reality, but we live in a world of seething chaos we see rise, leaders rising up. We see unstoppable cruelty and injustice and oppression and power grabbing. And it will be that way until Jesus comes again. But Jesus is coming again. And he will bring them all down. They are under his control. Because the answer is the cloud rider. The one who comes, the one who entered the, the presence of God riding on the cloud. He is the one who will... Defeat is evil. He is the one who came and lived and died and rose again. He is the one who crushed Satan's head. He is the one who's coming again. He is the one before whom every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord indeed. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom. And as members of that kingdom, he is our hope. Go out from this place this morning. Your life might not have changed. Your circumstances might remain as they are, but hold on to the cloud riding Savior. He is in control. There's a reassuring reality here for frightened people. And you might be frightened this morning, but be assured, He is in control of it all. God is on the throne, and we can trust Him. Music team, come and join us. We're going to sing a song as we finish. One of my, I, I've got to say, I love this song. Uh, I'm not sure how well you know it here. I can see on the database you've sung it before. We're going to sing the Ancient of Days, obviously uh, based on this uh, passage here where God is described as the Ancient of Days, the one in control, the one in authority. But let's celebrate, let's rejoice in the truth of God's word to us this morning. <laughs>
Father, thank you this morning for this clear word in your word that your kingdom ruled over by the cloud riding saviour will never pass away. Thank you that you have invited us, that you have called us to be part of that. Thank you for the confidence it gives us. And I would pray as we leave this place to go out into our lives this week, as we go back onto the front line, that we would be people of confidence, people of trust, people that, whose lives emanate a, a calmness, in the midst of the chaos of our world, that we would reflect well of you, that we might have opportunities to speak for you and of you. So we thank you for your word. Thank you that you are on the throne. Thank you that the kingdom is yours and no one can take it away from you. We worship you. We thank you. Now go with us. Bless us with the presence of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as we leave and go into this week. In Jesus' name, amen.